gender or uh, or whatever. So um, I um, I did my undergraduate in uh, at a private school outside of or outside of uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, my degree is actually in political science and sociology, and I took like a science class um, as an undergrad. Um, I really had no intent or plan to go to medical school. Uh, I didn't really have a plan to be quite honest. Um, and so after I graduated, I was bartending and trying to figure out what I wanted to do and decided that I wanted to go back to school and I wanted to go into medicine. I didn't really know what kind of medicine I wanted to do. Um, I was certain it was not to be a surgeon because everyone who was a surgeon kind of knew their whole life they were going to be a surgeon and had been working towards that their entire life. Um, so I um, ended up going back to school at Penn State. I did a post back at Penn State where I took all of my uh, pre-med uh, science classes in uh, four semesters or one, um, one complete calendar year, um, which is uh, a kind of a challenging way to get, you know, all of your science or prereqs uh, in, in a very short time. And then after that, I applied to, um, to medical school. Uh, my boyfriend at the time wanted to stay in Oregon. And so I only applied to one school and I did not get in that first year. Um, and so I reapplied the second year and was able to kind of broaden my, um, my net of places. Um, I included both allopathic and osteopathic programs. And I um, decided to attend Des Moines University in Des Moines, Iowa. I'd never been to Iowa, but when I interviewed there, I was very impressed with their campus and with um, a lot of the hands-on opportunities for learning that they had. So I graduated from medical school. Um, well, I guess before I graduated from medical school, third year, I was deciding what I wanted to go into. And I was, again, fairly certain that I was going to do OB. Um, I had all of my letters of recommendation stating that I was going to be a great obstetrician. Um, my personal statement was about being an obstetrician. And, um, and then I realized that the things I liked about ob gyn were probably not the best reasons to become an ob gyn And what I mean by that is um, I like doing C-sections. They're big surgeries. They're kind of messy, bloody. They're high adrenaline, high um, kind of intense uh, few moments. Um, and I thought, you know, and other than that, I didn't really like much else about ob gyn And I thought, gosh, maybe I shouldn't be going into a field where I look forward to like the intense uh, adrenaline rush and most women probably don't want the delivery of their child to be remembered as that. Um, so I uh, kind of took a step back and, and recognized that what I liked about that was the exact same thing that um, being a trauma surgeon and acute care surgeon allows for. So I kind of last minute shifted and decided to pursue uh, general surgery. I did my general surgery residency in Des Moines. Um, and then I did my surgical critical care fellowship here at the University of Iowa. And then I came here as faculty afterwards. Um, it's been, uh, I've been here now for four and a half years as faculty. I work as an emergency general surgeon, um, as a trauma surgeon, and then as a surgical intensivist. So I'm boarded in general surgery, surgical critical care, and then just took my neuro critical care boards as well. Um, you know, I, I think that my journey is certainly not a typical one, um, but I, I, I think that it, it required a lot of purposeful decisions that were made as opposed to just starting on a path and, and continuing that path um, without kind of thinking and analyzing about how I'm going to be there. Um, surgery is a pretty intense um, residency and uh, it's a pretty intense um, lifestyle. Um, it's a big commitment and um, your life changes a lot from when you start that journey as, as you progress. So, um, you know, I have, a, I have a daughter now, I have a five-year-old and how much time I want to spend at work is different now that I have a kid than it was when I didn't have a kid. Um, and so kind of, uh, figuring out how to balance um, a very demanding uh, profession 
uh, along with uh, wanting to be a mom has been probably the biggest challenge for me and the, and the thing that I am constantly um, being very deliberate about in my decisions on what I do and what I don't do. Um, I, um, like I was introduced, I am also the program director for our fellowship here. And then I'm also one of the co-directors of our ICU here. It gives me a, a really great opportunity to work with a lot of residents, a lot of medical students and, and the fellows, obviously. And that's probably one of the most enjoyable parts of my job is that um, not only do I get to take care of patients in the moment where they need someone emergently to take care of them, um, but also teach people um, how, how to do that and how to kind of spread that on. Um, that's, that's a little bit about me. So uh, general, surger, general surgery training is five years, and then uh, surgical critical care is one-year fellowship, and acute care surgery is a two-year fellowship. Um, you pretty much have the option of which fellowship you want to choose based on how much operative time you got during your, during your residency uh, to become a trauma surgeon or a surgical intensivist. Um, you know, my, my job is basically when someone comes in as a trauma, I'm in the emergency room there and, and we take care of them from the moment they arrive in the door to the moment they leave the hospital, whether that is in the operating room, in the ICU, in the emergency department or on the floor. Um, and then same thing for emergency general surgery. Um, we're, we're kind of the, the full spectrum of care, um, not just caring for people in their operative state, but also, you know, their non-operative things as well. And I guess really, I'll just open it up for questions from there. Um, I just want to make sure that that people, yeah, have the opportunity to answer any questions that they may have. Yeah. So maybe just to start out, knowing that you are a director of surgical the surgical critical care fellowship at uh, the University of Iowa, um, with our main audience being pre med pre health students, I'm sure it'd be interesting for us to hear. What do you look for in an applicant past just, you know, the mundane scores, the USMLEs, obviously, um, those are pretty, pretty um, emphasized. Past that, are there any misconceptions, any other um, points of emphasis that might not be as clear? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's been a big transition in medical education um, over the past couple of years in trying to um, Kind of more, uh, you know, it's a very catchphrase kind of thing, but a more holistic review of applicants um, so that we are not simply um, looking at things that may select for a, uh, for a non-diverse group of, of people. So for example, if you just look at numbers, if you just look at people who volunteer for things, um, you know, volunteering for things is great, but it's also um, a privileged position, right? That you have the opportunity to volunteer as opposed to be working. So um, fellowship is a little bit different than residency because obviously you've already completed your residency to get to fellowship. Um, but we just recently, I'm trying to pull it up right now. We just recently kind of um, revamped our, um, the things that we look for in applicants. And I will tell you that um, for fellowship, our program is no longer looking at USMLE scores or absite scores, um, because we are working under the assumption that if your program thought that you were good enough to graduate, that the numbers on the piece of paper may not matter as much. Now, um, Absite scores, which is the in-service training exam that general surgery residents take every single year, um, have been shown to predict board pass rate. So there's some risk in that because um, if you're taking people who are not, you know, you want people to be able to pass their boards, but we don't want applicants who are just really good at taking tests. We want people who are really good at taking care of patients. And um, those tests don't always correspond to that. So aside from that, we look at um, kind of the journey that the applicant has made and potential um, um, like barriers or things that they've kind of overcome to get where they are. Um, whether that is, you know, I think everyone along the way has had some kind of thing that they've had to work hard at to get to where they are. And so we look at those kinds of things. We look at you know, yes, we look at research, but if you've never published something before, 
um, that's not going to eliminate you, you either. Um, I would say probably one of the most important things that I look at is, is your personal statement. And are you able to relay to me in a, you know, a short one page thing, why you want to be an intensivist um, and why, or why you want to do trauma or, or um, acute care surgery. Um, and uh, what is your drive to be successful? Because I think those are the two big things is that if, if someone really wants this, I know that they'll work hard to get it independent of whatever the numbers on the paper say. You know, there's a lot of data out there too about the um, kind of uh, even, you know, letters of recommendation. I, I used to think were really helpful, but it's kind of interesting when you look at the data that um, the descriptions for men used in a letter of recommendation are often different than the descriptions used for, for women. And if you're relying um, completely on those letters of recommendations, you will almost always preferentially select for a pool of men um, because they are often um, described in more stronger, um, uh, act with more stronger attributes uh, and more uh, active attributes as opposed to more passive attributes. So um, you have to be kind of careful about, about what you rely on. And so I try to take a lot of that from our interview and from our personal statement. Yeah, that definitely is interesting. And I want to also ask about how, as an osteopathic trained surgeon, how do you apply osteopathy to your specialty being trauma and uh, acute care surgery? Yeah, um, I don't. Um, I mean, that's probably the most real realistic answer. I, I don't practice any osteopathic medicine, but I think that my osteopathic training has definitely helped in my path because there's such a focus on anatomy and such a focus on structure and function. And, um, and um, I think that's helpful as a surgeon. I think that um, kind of gives you a little bit of a heads up uh, when you're starting out. Um, but I don't practice any osteopathic manipulative medicine at all. I guess kind of to continue off of the questions from earlier for um, especially being a, a fellowship uh, director um, for IMGs, any international graduates, are there specific things like, for example, a lot of people discuss American U.S. clinical experience as being um, a big step up for IMGs. Does it really make a difference in your application um, and how much of a difference does it make in the end, in your opinion? As to if you start off as an IMG or not, or if you- Yeah, as to if, yeah, if you start off as an IMG and on top of that being um, an IMG that does have significant US clinical experience. Um, so the most, for, for fellowship, and again, I can't speak for residency. Um, the biggest challenge I have um, with IMGs for fellowship is that um, to be a, to be eligible for a fellowship, you have to be, um, you have to have completed three years of an ACGME approved residency. Um, and so what we get a lot of times is some people who have um, completed residency as an IMG or are trained as an IMG, but they were not necessarily a ACGME approved programs. And so they're looking for kind of a, a way into the system here. And so they want to apply through, um, through our fellowship. And, and if you haven't done three years, um, we can't, you're just not even eligible, right? Um, as for the IMGs who have completed uh, that, um, you know, ACGME, you know, um, um, Lebanon has an ACGME approved uh, residency. Um, I, um, Qatar has another program as well that, that is ACGME. Um, I don't think that um, there is a significant barrier for those IMGs from those ACGME approved residencies. I do think that it probably helps for them to have some experience in the US because people know what they are comparing, you know, um, whereas a lot of people don't understand the healthcare systems in other countries. 
um, they do understand it in the US. And so I think right or wrong that it, it just becomes an easier basis for comparison if they have more US experience. I see. And going back to your more so your own clinical experience with being a director, being a resident, um, over that time, what has been a unique or interesting case that you've seen? Maybe you want to uh, discuss it here, discuss how you went through that case report. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think probably the most interesting cases that I've seen have been um, trauma cases. And I think, um, you know, I, I now have had um, you know, I had a lady who stabbed herself with a sword in her ab, like a sword, not like a knife, like a sword <laughs> in her abdomen. Um, and, um, you know, who just comes into the ER and EMS had just taped the sword to her so that they didn't take it out until she got to us. Um, and um, that's probably, you know, that's probably one of the most interesting cases because um, the the preparation for potential things that are injured is is or or the the possibility of potential things injured is is very significant um, and you have to be prepared for the moment you take the sword out is have we now just opened a hole in the aorta that was previously occluded or did this just go through bowel or what did this um, what was affected uh, by the sword you know and and, her, and you have to be prepared for all of those things and how are you going to deal with them. Um, and in this particular case, you know, she thankfully only injured her colon and small intestine. But, uh, you know, as we're like taking her to the operating room, all of these things are like running through my head about um, based on where the sword is, what are the things that could have hit and, and how catastrophic could this become quite quickly in the operating room. Um, and unlike, you know, other types of surgery, you don't know what's coming in for the day. So I come to work and I don't know, you know, that the lady who stabbed herself is, is coming into the door. And so there's really um, no way to, uh, you know, run through your head in advance or the morning of as you're getting ready, um, you know, what your day is going to be like. And, and you just kind of roll with the punches and you get a page. There's someone stab victim victim in the ER. Um, that's probably been the most interesting case that I've that I've cared for. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a patient who stabbed himself in the chest multiple times and hit his heart. He had a pericardial effusion and tamponade and and um, you know he's now got his heart repaired. He's out of the ICU and and clinically you know doing much better. Um, but you know it's um it's it's sad to see people who injure themselves that way. And, but it's, you know, it's nice to know that uh, we're able to help them and fix the problem um, in an expedient manner. And then another question we have from a student here is kind of touched on this a little before with uh, the letters of recommendation, but as a woman in medicine, especially in a intense strong field, like you are with intensive care, have you dealt with gender discrimination? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, this has been something kind of ongoing, you know, from even my residency. You know, I would say that um, um, that men are often given more autonomy during training than women are. Um, that the opportunities uh, presented to men and women vary, and you have to be very, um, again, purposeful about uh, not allowing that to happen and making sure that uh, you are not just kind of letting other people get to do things and not standing up for yourself, I guess, that, that you too are capable of doing something and should be able to do it um, independent of, of your gender. Um, I routinely have, um, uh, not routinely, that's a bad word. I have frequently had problems um, with nurses actually more often than probably any anyone else um, of um, not, doing things that I ask for or order to be done. Um, and then if someone, one of my partners, for example, asks for it, who happens to be male, it's no problem. Um, when I was 
a resident, I, you know, we have 360 evaluations where like nurses do evaluations, physical therapists, everyone does an evaluation of you as a resident, um, you know, that they did not appreciate my stern voice in the trauma bay. Um, and I thought, <laughs> You have to have a, you know, someone has to be in charge in the trauma bay. And I can't even fathom anyone telling one of my male colleagues that they didn't like their uh, stern voice in the trauma bay. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, um, well, not I think, when I was interviewing for my first job, um, it was my daughter at that point was um, like six months old when I started interviewing. Um, I was asked if I'd considered working part-time instead of full-time at one of uh, the jobs I interviewed at um, because I was now a parent and wouldn't I rather work part-time because um, that way I could still be a good mom. Um, so one, that's illegal. And if anyone ever has that conversation with you as a job, just know that's illegal. It's against the law for them to talk to you about your like child raising desires. Um, I was told that I, you know, probably wouldn't be as good of a surgeon in the operating room because if something happened to my child, that I would be too worried about them and not be able to finish operating. Um, you know, I, and it's interesting because I, and what I responded was, well, I would hope that any father would be equally as concerned if something had happened to their child while they were operating also. Um, but yes, absolutely, gender discrimination continues to be an issue in medicine. It continues to be a problem in surgery. Um, it, it is, uh, I think, here at the University of Iowa, there's a lot of effort to uh, made to try and overcome that, um, but definitely still a problem. And then going to the difference between surgical critical care and acute care surgery fellowships, What's the, the differences that you as a fellowship director see in terms of training between those two? Yeah, so a surgical critical care fellowship is a one-year fellowship. Acute care surgery is a two-year fellowship. The requirements for surgical critical care are nine months in the ICU and three in a surgical ICU and three months in um, an elective, whatever your elective may be, depending on the program you're at or depending on um, what you're interests are. Acute care surgery, like I said, is two years. One of those years is dedicated to surgical critical care. Again, nine months of, of one of those years is, is surgical critical care. And the other year is dedicated to um, rotating through different surgical services to get a better, um, to get more experience. So for example, you have to do vascular, you have to do trauma, a lot of trauma, emergency general surgery, um, you can do time with neurosurgery, you can do time with ortho, um, you can do time with uh, interventional um, radiology. And the purpose of it is really to make sure that you, or with cardiothoracic, but to make sure that as a trauma surgeon, that you are equipped to deal with any emergency that could walk into the door um, and that you have exposure to all of those things. Often what we see is that uh, people who don't feel like they got enough experience in residency are um, more likely to do the two-year um, acute care surgery program as opposed to the one-year surgical critical care program. Um, that's, that's pretty much the main difference. I will say that more and more programs are going to the two-year acute care surgery program to give um, their fellows an opportunity to operate throughout fellowship. So um, at my program, uh, nine months out of the year, you're not operating. And a lot of um, people have a lot of anxiety about going nine months without operating. Um, and so uh, a, more and more programs are transitioning to a two-year acute care surgery. Regardless of which path you choose, um, you are eligible to sit for the um, surgical critical care boards and you are um, then, once you're boarded in surgical critical care, that's the training necessary to kind of work as a trauma surgeon, an acute care surgeon, emergency general surgeon, or an intensivist. So that's either one of those paths is acceptable to get to those jobs. And then going back to your journey through medicine, you talked about um, having first interest in OB-GYN 
and then transitioning to after realizing more of the details behind OB-GYN, um, the atmosphere behind it, transitioning to now trauma and, and um, critical care surgery. So for those, again, with our audience being mainly pre-medical students, pre-health students, um, for those who know that they want to go into medicine but are not exactly sure what type of medicine they want to go into, do you have any pieces of advice for them? Yeah, so um, I think the the first step is to know what you love, but even more so to know what you don't love. So I don't love clinic. Um, I do not like going to clinic at all. And um, and so any job that was gonna require that for me, what I knew was not what I was interested in, or at least where that was the, the, the main focus, right? So automatically I know that family medicine, not gonna work for me because a day in the OR, or, you know, surgery residency as a medical, you know, or um, on your rotations in medical school, you get to the hospital at five in the morning, you might leave at eight o'clock at night. That day went by way faster than the get to clinic at eight and leave at four. Um, you know, that eight to four felt to me like it was dragging on and on. And I was constantly looking at the clock. Um, I couldn't stay engaged. So I think the first thing as you're kind of going through um, medical school is figuring out what you like and what you don't like. Um, and then just keep an open mind. You know, um, I never in a million years would have thought that I was going to end up as a surgeon um, and never, never thought that that was, was where I was headed. Um, but I think as you experience more things throughout medical school, um, and have the opportunity to rotate through different services as a medical student, um, that if there's something that you really enjoy, that you should give it, give it pause and, and really contemplate, is that something that you would like? That said, I also think it's really important to consider your life outside of medicine um, because uh, my life would be a lot, you know, I, I wish I could have a job where I also didn't take call, like, because I like to be home at night and have dinner with my daughter. <laughs> and so, um, I, you know, that's just kind of the give that I have to give to get the job that I want. But I think that recognizing how your priorities outside of medicine may be influenced um, by what your, what your career goals are also is, is important, too. And during fellowship, um, usually some fellowships might have an extra year for research specifically. Uh, was that the case for you? Did you at least have research integrated throughout and what type of research was it? Yeah, so um, part of the surgical critical care fellowship is that you have to complete some project. They're pretty vague about what project means. So it may not necessarily be traditional research. It may just be a QI project or something. Um, and so, um, what I did was designed a study um, that uh, we ended up instituting several years later, um, but that unfortunately got closed because of accrual issues. But, um, you know, my interest is in, uh, or one of my interests, I guess, is in um, ventilator strategies in um, trauma patients that are at risk or have um, acute lung injury and uh, or ARDS. And so um, I am specifically interested in a ventilator setting called airway pressure release ventilation and um, its use prophylactically as opposed to reactively to hypoxia. So I, um, I basically designed a study looking at uh, traditional ventilation compared to airway pressure release ventilation. Uh, and, and outcomes for my, for my project. We have a student here asking, how does the dynamics between attendings, fellows, residents, PAs, and other, um, other, other people serving on, on the team work in trauma? Is it usually split up between um, them being assigned to the trauma bay or the ICU, or does, how, how does everyone float around really um, yeah. within the team? So I can describe for you what we do at the University of Iowa. Um, our, um, we have one team with faculty, residents, um, PAs, nurse practitioners, um, that is assigned to the emergency general surgery service. We have one team that is assigned to the trauma service, and we have, um, 
one team that is, uh, or you know, a kind of bigger group of people assigned to the ICU. So um, for trauma, we'll say, um, everyone has the trauma pager. And if a trauma alert or activation gets paged out, you know, everyone pretty much on the team, APPs, residents, students, this faculty um, goes to the trauma bay um, and does the initial primary and secondary survey of the patient there. If the patient needs to go to the operating room, um, that's typically, you know, uh, the faculty um, and then one or two residents um, and or students would, would go to the operating room with that patient that are part of the trauma team. And then um, if they go to the ICU, then the ICU team manages them while they're out in the in the um, in the ICU, as well as the trauma team. So there's kind of a uh, collaborative uh, work, and that you know that's the whole team again rounds. Um, the residents and the PAs are kind of responsible um, throughout the day of answering questions, um, you know, evaluating the patients, following up on different imaging or whatever. Um, and um, when the patient is stable to leave the ICU and go to the floor, then the trauma team continues to manage that patient on the floor. So a typical day in trauma might be you start rounding um, and then a, a, a trauma is paged out. You have to stop what you're doing, go to the trauma bay. You may go to the operating room, you may not, and then you come back to rounds. And so your day is very haphazard. And it's kind of hit or miss at who's doing what. And so often the work gets divvied up um, between the team members as to where people need to be and what needs to be happen, happening um, because there can even be multiple traumas at the same time as you can imagine, so. Definitely. And looking back at previous applications um, in fellowship, are there any specific fellowship applications that you remember that really wowed you? And could you speak on why exactly that might've been an especially unique application? Yeah. Um, this last cycle of applications, someone wrote a poem for their personal statement, um, and it's, uh, you know, as I was reading it, I thought it was kind of like, oh, this is an interesting choice, and I wasn't sure how I felt about it, to be quite honest, because it seemed a little like something that people talk about doing, but don't actually do, you know what I mean? Um, but I remember it, right? Like I still remember that application and it stood out to me. And so it achieved the goal, right? Of like something that stood out to me and something that I would remember. I remember everything about our application because I remember like this stood out to me. Um, and then, um, and so I would say just anything that, that really draws attention or makes you stand out compared to, to others is, 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 is one good way to do that. Um, and then another application that stood out to me was the, you know, the, in the personal statement, there was just a, um, you know, a lot of personal statements are very like, this is my journey and why I want to do, be a surgical intensivist. And this one was just very, um, like kind of blunt about a lot of things that, you know, referring to the dumpster fire where he trained. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I would never think of writing that, but also like it stood out again, you know? And so whether good or bad, you know, if you can make your application stand out, I think that's, um, you know, that's really important. Um, the other thing I would say is people who follow up after their interview with letters, um, you know, emails now to me being like, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Um, and, and kind of follow up with something personal besides like, thank you so much or whatever. Um, and then people who can really make it, you know, we had one applicant this year who she was just really outstanding to the point where I was like, we need to hire her when she's done. Like my goal isn't to get her here as a fellow. My goal is to get her, her here as like a junior partner um, because she just really stood out as, um, and was, she, saw the vision beyond fellowship you know this wasn't fellowship wasn't just like the end but like beyond fellowship and so i think that's important also 
And looking back over, you know, the years that have led up to where you are now as an attending with your medical journey, is there anything you wish you had prepared for or done differently? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think the route that I took um, cost me more money. Um, I definitely um, have more in student loans than I think a lot of people would otherwise have um, because I had to go back to school when I could have accomplished the goal of getting my prereqs as an undergrad, you know? So um, I think uh, sometimes I question whether that was a good good idea or not. That said, I think, you know, it was kind of nice for me to not, you know, to spend my undergraduate time not like worrying about medical school also. Um, so sometimes I think that maybe I should have done that differently, but I'm not, I'm not totally, I'm not totally sure that I, I if given the opportunity, actually would do that differently. Um, I think that, um, one thing that I would have done differently in medical school is um, really taken more time to learn things that I wasn't going into. So I spent a lot of time my fourth year, for example, once I'd already matched, you know, just worrying about surgery, but really the rest of my life was going to be spent learning about surgery. And that was the time I had to really learn about everything else. And um, while I did that to some degree, um, maybe didn't take advantage of that as much as I should have. And um, that would be one thing that I think I would do differently is, is once you know what you're doing and where you're going, spending the time you have um, focusing on the other things that you're not going to get to learn the rest of your life. The other thing that I will say that I know I would for sure 100% do differently is I became very focused on being a successful surgery resident, a successful surgeon, a successful intensivist. And I did that at a cost um, to my family and my friends. And I became very um, kind of is not isolated, but like, you know, I didn't make time for people who are important to me. And it took having my daughter for me to kind of realize that. But before my daughter, there were plenty of important people in my life who, um, during my training, unfortunately, took the back seat. And I do regret um, how important work was to me at, um, at the expense of relationships. And I think I would do that better uh, in the future. And going back to the previous application that you mentioned, um, you, you were hoping to have that applicant not only for fellowship, but also as, like you mentioned, a junior partner because of their vision. So reflecting on that, I think the interview seems to be a, a place to um, kind of communicate what your vision is so that that program director would know exactly if you're on the same page. Isn't that right? Is that the case? Absolutely. And I ask every you know, fellowship is a little different from residency because I think the the purpose should be for the, the them to find a place that will get them where they want. Um, whereas for residency, I feel like most residents feel like I just have to get somewhere, you know, I have to get a spot somewhere. And really for, for fellowship, I feel like it should be, um, can I provide you the education and the experience that you need here at the University of Iowa to be the surgeon, the intensivist that you want to be. And that is not going to be the same for everybody, right? Like um, if you want uh, a really great, uh, you know, you want to work in a trauma center that is heavy penetrating trauma with gunshots every day, I can't get you that here at the University of Iowa, you know. Um, I can get you a really, really, um, significant breadth and depth into intensive care, um, both neurologic, surgical, cardiac, you know, I can absolutely get you that here. Um, but I think it's important to ask people and for people to, to relay to fellowship and, and residency directors um, where you hope to be with the understanding that 
there's no commitment to whatever you say, right? Like whatever people tell me, they're not bound to by any stretch. Um, but um, to just have some vision of, of in 10 years, what is my life going to look like? And how am I going to get there by going to your program? And, and what do I need in order to achieve that goal? Yeah. And to your point, it seems to vary place to place, like somewhere like Iowa, the Midwest, like you mentioned, it's not going to be exactly as intense as it might be in something like Maryland in Baltimore. Um, so with that said, when someone is, and we're still pre-medical students, so this is going to be years in advance, but when someone is looking for a fellowship um, or possibly a residency too, um, what exactly should they look for to see if they're on the same page with that vision, just even before the interview, just so they, they know how to prepare, what to exactly discuss and how to communicate that? Yeah, so I think, you know, the big three things um, that I think you need to know is um, how much of your, how much, so three big things, what are you going to do clinic, clinically, what are you going to do research, and what are you going to do teaching, and how can the program that you're looking at um, help you in those three ways. Now, I feel like for residency, you kind of have to pre prevent, present yourself as this, like, I love everything and I love, I want to be an excellent doctor and I want to do all the research and I love teaching. Um, and I, I feel like that's how most um, students feel they have to present themselves for residency. Um, I don't interview residents here. So again, I don't know that, but I will say that um, I fully recognize that most people um, aren't going to be avid researchers. You know, most people aren't going to have NIH grants. Um, most people are not going to be program directors. You know, they're, they're, it's okay if you tell me, I want to be a really good clinician and I want to perfect my skills as an intensivist so that I can go um, wherever and whatever I see I know that I am prepared to, to handle what may come my way. Um, and so those are the, you know, some people may love research and then they're gonna say like, how are, are you going to help me build my career as a budding researcher? You know, do you, you know, here at the university for, for residency, we have a T32 grant. So that gives half of our residents the opportunity to step out um, for two years to do focus research for two years. Now it extends your residency to a seven year program as opposed to a five year program and that's before fellowship. But if you're really interested in, um, in research and really interested in fellowship, gosh, what a great opportunity. Whereas going to like an osteopathic residency program, you're not going to get the opportunity to really take two years away to, to do research because that's not the focus of an osteopathic um, residency program. So um, I would say knowing kind of in those big three realms where your interests lie will help you kind of find out, does this program have what I need and, and would I be a good fit there? One student also asks um, about your thoughts on something called an SMP or special master's program before medical school. Um, so like in a gap year or um, possibly longer, taking that kind of program um, also across the whole board, whether it's before medical school, maybe during medical school, does a master's program play a role, uh, having a master's play a role in an application? Have you seen differences in evaluating applications with people having two degrees? Um, yeah, I think it plays a role. I don't think that it necessarily puts you above someone who didn't pursue their master's, but I think it gives, uh, you know, it's another dimension or another thing that you could have done. For example, if you haven't done a lot of research, but you've got your master's, you know, that's just like another, another thing to show kind of what your, what your, um, what, like your commitment to, to, to what you're doing, I guess. Um, I don't know that I have ever, you know, ranked someone higher because they got their master's, um, but I think it just gives a, um, a more well-rounded 
person really and just another opportunity to show like something that that you're specifically interested in and, and something else to even talk about how you're going to integrate that into um, you know why does that matter why is that helpful if you can help tell me why you got your master's other than like well I had a year and I needed to do something um, but why, how you're going to integrate that into your clinical practice or why that matters I think that is the more helpful thing and for other degrees too, like an MBA, um, MPH, PhD, or even JD that people might take before medical school, maybe taking a break somewhere um, in between the whole process during medical school, does that really have any other difference between what you just said earlier with master's programs? Does, does it really make a difference? Like, for example, having a PhD might involve having more research. How would that fit in? Yeah, again, I think a lot of it just depends on what your ultimate goals are and how you're able to relate why having your PhD has anything to do with, or does it have anything to do with why you're, you're interested in um, medicine? You know, some people get their PhD and realize like, no, I'm, you know, like after the fact, oh, I wanted to go into medicine. And those are two independent things. Um, some people get their PhD and want to work as like a surgeon scientist, you know? Um, and so then uh, it kind of just depends, I think on, on, what your goals are in integrating your advanced degrees with a medical education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And before going into, into like, for example, you mentioned going into trauma surgery, OB, were there any other fields outside of those specialties that you are possibly considering? Um, I thought about internal medicine when I first started. I worked at, as a dialysis tech, and so I had a lot of experience with uh, patients with renal failure, and I thought um, about, um, you know, nephrology specifically, um, and then, um, and then otherwise, um, no, those were kind of the only, uh, you know, as my third year rotations went on, um, you know, I liked my first rotation. It was at a county hospital. And so um, it's kind of an uh, underprivileged uh, hospital. Um, and it was a hospitalist service, but also an ICU service. And I really enjoyed the time in the ICU there, which is in part, you know, how I knew I wanted to be an intensivist as well. But um, I personally just like really sick patients. Um, I don't enjoy elective surgery because uh, I, you know, it, it's not as stimulating to me as taking care of really sick people who come in with a problem that needs to be addressed kind of urgently. I have also a student asking um, about their personal statements. So if they get rejected, if they're a reapplicant for another cycle, do you recommend that they change up their personal statement um, and what questions should they ask themselves? Also, in the meantime, depending on where they land, do you think it might also be advantageous to consider retaking things like an MCAT or improving your GPA? Um, so I think that question depends a lot on what your MCAT score and your GPA are to start off with, because some programs will just have um, like a, a flat cutoff. And if you don't meet that cutoff, you're not even going to they're not even gonna look at your personal statement, right? Because they have so many applications to go through, they have to find some way to filter through them. And so some programs use the MCAT score, some um, use your GPA. So um, if you think your MCAT score is competitive, I don't know that getting one point higher or two points higher is going to make that big of a difference. If you think you can make a significant improvement in your MCAT score, then I do think that's, um, you know, a valuable thing to do. Same with GPA is that um, taking one or two more classes and even doing well in one or two more classes is really unlikely to change your GPA in a significant way, right? Because you've got so many classes already. Um, doing poorly in an additional class will affect your GPA in a significant way. Um, and, you know, I think these are this is actually a good time to be like, what is a major way that I can uh, kind of change my application and not these minor, like I'm going to get one more point on my MCAT. Now, if you did atrocious on the MCAT, 
you know, it, for whatever reason, and you know that you can improve your score significantly, yeah, you should retake it. But this might be a good opportunity to be like, you know, I'm going to get my master's in public health. Public health has a lot to do with medicine in general. And it's also a good opportunity for me to show that my um, GPA, whatever it was as an undergrad, does not necessarily reflect my current level of work or commitment or ability to improve my GPA. I think that might be, um, you know, a, a really good time to uh, consider, you know, a master's in anatomy, um, you know, these kind of one-year programs that are actually going to uh, make you potentially more competitive. Absolutely. And before we end the hour um, for virtual shouting, first of all, I want to thank you so much for your time. Before we do end the hour and wrap up our session today, do you have any last words of advice to pre-medical, pre-health students listening who have so many years ahead? They have medical school ahead of them, residency, possibly fellowship, so they can really leverage the advice um, that they have now. Any last words of advice for them? Yeah, I, you know, um, it is really hard to get caught up in the um, journey, and it's or not in the journey, in the end results and like keep being like, you know, and uh, I've got to get to medical school for four years. I've got to get to residency for five years. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And you're constantly looking at the next target. And in the meantime, like your life is passing by. And so don't, that's my biggest piece of advice is don't let your life kind of pass you by where you finish and you become a faculty surgeon or whatever you're going to be. Um, and now you're like, well, Ten, a decade of my life has gone by and I kind of missed it. Um, so that's uh, sometimes I think hard for students to uh, really feel confident and that they should kind of enjoy their life because they're constantly working very hard. You know, I'll tell you that if I had to go to medical school again now and my application now compared to the applications that we look at for uh, medical school for residency, I don't think I'd get in. You know, I think it's becoming more and more and more competitive um, each year. Um, and that's, I think, a detriment to the field because I think we get less well-rounded well people in medicine and people who just become so focused on the ultimate goal. But just remember like, live your life and like um, enjoy your, your, you know, enjoy that 10 years while you're working towards that, that ultimate goal. Definitely. Well, first of all, thank you so much. I think that really wraps up today's session today. Um, like I said, we're, we're very thankful for our speakers who take time out of their schedule to join us. So thank you so much, Dr. Allen, yeah. for our audience. Uh, to receive a certificate for the session, you must pass the quiz on our website, which is now uploaded, and be sure to join us for our next virtual chatting session with Dr. Arabunda on December 1st at 7 p.m. Central. Again, thank you, Dr. Allen, for joining us. Um, and I see that you... I'm just going to say one last thing. If anyone has any questions for me about anything, I just threw my email in the chat. You are welcome to email me at any time. I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. So Definitely. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, and hope everyone has a great night. Yep. Thank you.